Hello there everyone, the Andrada here, and welcome back to episode 117 of our Enigmatica 6 Expert Let's Play series, where today we are going into uh, Atom, setting up our excavator to get us uh, Nebu ore in Buku amounts, uh, and also getting compact machines set up, so let's get started. Welcome back, my friends, to another wonderful day here in the world of the Andrada and Enigmatica 6 Expert. Uh, where today we need to turn our map on because I forgot to do so, and it is pack update day. We have updated to version 1.4.1. Uh, it was released on July 14th, and I gave it about a week or so to make sure that all bugs were, you know, worked out with it and anything that needed to be fixed was fixed. And it seems to be fairly stable now, so we're good to go. Um, I'm going to have to fix a couple config changes because, as you can see, my, uh, you know, disabling of my mm, teleports and all that stuff is re-enabled. But... That's all minor stuff, nothing terribly too crazy. Is this a uh, apotheosis boss? Usually if I see a tarantula hawk around here, it's because it's an apotheosis boss. And it is. Samson, get wrecked. What do you got for me? Uh, Samson spiked retreating blockade of strength. Sweet. Nothing interesting, though. Okay, cool. Yeah, usually if I see a tarantula hawk floating around here, it's an apotheosis boss because they don't generally spawn in this area. And so the fact that they're there tells me there's something weird going on. Anyway, uh, so with the pack update, there's just it's just a lot of minor bug fixes and things like that. Nothing too crazy from what I read um, on the change log. You definitely want to check out the change log yourself before updating and everything just to be safe. But yeah, nothing doesn't seem like there's anything like too ridiculously crazy or anything with this. Um, so we'll just move on and continue on as normal. And if we run into anything crazy, well, uh, well we will. Some recipe tweaks, making things cheaper, uh, making some things easier to do and stuff like that, uh, changing things around. In between episodes, I went ahead and did the uh, thing. So if you remember last episode, I was having, oh, let's get out of the lava. I was having an issue with my um, occultism, my uh, thing, right? If we, I don't know why I flew over here instead of just teleporting, but if we pop downstairs, I was having an issue with this setup here, right? With our redstone links. Turns out, uh, thank you, Nurk Sakura, the redstone links only have a 128 block range, um, and our house is quite a lot more away from that it's almost double we're, we're about 200 blocks or so away from home uh so we have our setup here i went ahead and set up uh, a zibius's spectral compulsion as well over here to automate the production of the stable wormholes because the stable wormholes are used for matter receivers interdimensional modules from portality and things like that uh a hellfire forge if we ever needed another one uh, but in order to make our compact machine we need to make this dimensional module which requires stable wormholes and then we need um there's something else maybe these wireless routers something else around here needed uh oh wait the network receivers they need matter receivers and matter transmitters both of which require stable wormholes so uh taught the system how to do that again it's exactly the same setup as is over here basically mirrored except for the fact that instead of this guy sending to the precision sawmill what happens is this guy just vacuums up our output item and then this guy pulls from him into this, sends the pulse down and then sends the item up to the barrel, which is then bound back at home. Uh, and everything works. In order to get this to work, um, as you can see, I had to do a little bit of finagling with our redstone links, okay? So, for example, this has two stable wormholes in it. This has two dimensional storage crystals. And if we fly over to our little area where I have these set up, I have to have intermediary um redstone links so you can kind of see there's one on my map there's one singular chunk that is loaded and that's because that's where our intermediary redstone links are sitting so what happens is is the double crystal gets received here and it's outputting a pulse here to a crystal and a redstone same thing here double wormhole uh or, or double wormhole frame goes to wormhole frame redstone and then we have another setup over here another intermediary link which takes that uh that and pushes it into this and then the same thing that pushes into this and then finally we have one of these sitting at home uh, on the crafter to do the pulse now 
that is the way that I figured out how to do it. Uh, there is an easier way to do it. And again, thanks to Nurik Sakura. Uh, there is the redstone receiver. I completely forgot the, the, the redstone transceivers from RF Tools Utility, the transmitter and the receiver transceiver. Uh, these are... I, they can you, exact same thing as the redstone link. You set them up, you, they link to a diff, they link to channels, so you can pair them like channel one, channel two, channel three, whatever. Uh, and every time you use them, you get a different channel. And they they work interdimensionally, infinite range, and everything. And we could just use these. I already set this up, so I'm not going to worry about it. It's already done. But going forward, if we do any more automation of occultism, we're going to set them up with these redstone receivers. They're really not that expensive. And Ender Pearl is the hardest part. Uh, and I guess the advanced PCB, if you're not, you know, as far into uh, the mod pack as we are, where stuff like that's fairly simple at this point. We have a hole a hole in the ground i have no idea what happened here um but anyway yeah so that's that it works perfectly fine now i just have to have those intermediate relays uh so we got that going i also did get the industrious b set up uh it really wasn't terribly too difficult if we take a look at industrious b in the jar if you remember it was just uh getting this set up it's iron honeycomb blocks and iron honey blocks so basically what i did was i turned off the production of uh iron honey in this uh no no i'm sorry i forgot i i, I have iron over there i lied i'm lying to you uh acacia block is what the uh, industrious bee uses i forgot i can i was going to do it that way uh but if we take a look over here from a long while ago we have tons of just random honeycombs from when we had the centrifuge set up in here and i had plenty of iron honeycomb in here in order to be able to put it into my centrifuge that i just made and set up over here to get our iron uh the iron i made the the two iron honey blocks that we needed for this uh what am i looking at the industrious so i was able to make the two iron honeycomb blocks that part was easy it was the iron honey blocks that was the hard part um, and it really wasn't that hard. All I had to do was just run it through here, get the iron honey bottles and convert them over. As you can see, uh, it took a while. There's only a 2% chance, I believe, uh, when running this through the centrifuge. That's meaty honey. Uh, the iron honey recipe is recipe is this 2% chance of getting iron honey out of this. So it took probably about, well, it was at least two, two and a half stacks really based on this. So yeah. It, it, it took a little bit, but we got it. Uh, so then all I did was run that through our dissolution chamber. I taught the system how to do this, but pink slime we already have. Pink slime we have in the system, advanced machine frame, all that stuff. So fairly simple to get the end bean. And now we should be getting industrious honeycomb blocks, which are used for quite a lot of different things. The main thing that it's being used for or that we're going to use it for right now is mechanical crafting. Um, you making compact machines specifically the maximum size compact machine so the system knows how to make everything here we can we can kick this off and request one of these uh which i'm going to do so that way by the end of this episode we can go ahead and get the stuff that we need there's a lot of crafts that it's going to have to do so we're just going to let it let it run do its thing uh again with the redstone flux cells uh, and i don't know what recipe is using those we have them Redstone flux cells are here. It's just because there's NVT data. And I don't know. Uh, I think it was the energy module that's requesting those. Energy module. Please don't. Please don't uh, die on me here. Uh, yeah, it's you. I'm going to need to actually request one of these. And then. Look, I see energy zero transfer 1K. Energy zero, transfer 1K. I don't understand why these have such issues. And you know what? I'm actually just going to clear that out. And we're going to do that. And now maybe it should be able to request it. Let's go to Iron Crafter. I am out of room in my crafters. Oh, there we go. I passed it. So now if I say energy module, you should be able to request that. Yes. Okay, cool. And now... Yeah, the only thing that we were missing was that. And how about the portal controller? Does that require anything fancy or is it just it's just taking a little bit? Yep, 
it just took a minute. Okay, cool. So we, we should have everything in there and we can get to that. What we want to work on today is getting our excavator set up in the uh, in, in Atom, because with all of our infrastructure and all of our setup that we've done the past couple of episodes with occultism and our mob tower and everything, we are now able to make uh, the blazing ender gate. I went ahead and crafted one up so that it was ready to go for us. And yeah, there we go. We have a blazing ender gate. So our ender gate quest is complete. Bam. Uh, I also went ahead and made network stuff. I made the network receiver and the network transmitter. We don't need them at the moment, but I figure I might as well pick them up for the quest reward. Uh, and let's get ourselves a network card, too. I thought I had kicked that one off, but I guess not. Uh, so the ender gate is set up. Um, and if we go downstairs, I do also have our ender cell set up here. It is being power being pulled from our energy cell. Normally, you don't have to do this. You'd probably replace your energy cell with your ender cell. And then that way you just have one because this does act as a battery you can pull in you can do everything that this can do as well as wireless power i want both that way my wireless system has a its own separate buffer we are going to be gated by the speed that is available from this elite universal cable um which is what uh, 400 or yeah, 400,000 RF per tick. So we are going to have a little bit of a, you know, a bottleneck with that. Is that a quest too? Yeah, I'm assuming it is. Um, because, but our ender cell, our nitro ender cell can only transfer at 400,000 RF per tick anyway. So it really doesn't make too much of a difference, right? So like this, this max output is 400,000 RF and this is only 18,000. So it really doesn't matter that we can only go up to 400,000 because or that this is only doing 400 because that's all this can do. One thing to note, I made this ender cell. Uh, we made it a, a while back and everything. In order to get this buffer, you have to put a ender energy cell into it. Uh, you just take your energy cell and you plop it inside of this guy. Pick your channel because it's going to have multiple different channels and you just shift click this in there and then this will give it its 1 million buffer or 2 million or, or whatever you was we had a nitro energy cell from a quest reward and i i meant to show this on camera but i was testing to see okay does this work uh, am i remembering this correctly and yeah well i accidentally did the thing uh, but we had a energy cell uh, nitro energy cell from a quest reward a couple episodes back so we i threw that in there and that's why we have 140 million buffer going on here um, but now we have blazing ender gate, which should I don't think I have to do anything right. I think it's just automatically paired. Uh, I can pick the channel that I want this to operate off of. Right. Uh, yeah, it, it only attaches to things that need power. So there we go. I can pick the channel and then I can say that you're going to output or receive from that channel. OK, cool. These things are really cool. Uh, Generally, I, I I love using these. Eventually, we will switch over to uh, flux networks, mainly because these have infinite uh, energy input and energy out point. However, they require antimatter, so it's going to be a little while before we can get to uh, flux networks. But these are going to be a great uh, interim wireless power for us. And it's good that we have actual true wireless power now instead of having to use our entangled blocks. Not that the entangled blocks are a bad thing. They work fantastically. Uh, and we have the full 400,000 you know, output capability that this thing has when we use an entangled block so it, it really doesn't hurt or anything but they're just they're clunky and overall you know it, true wireless power interdimensionally is where we want to go so anyway uh we're gonna pop over to atom before i do so though i'm gonna go to the uh instance folder for minecraft there is a building gadget for the excavator a copy and paste template um, so I'm going to go ahead and grab that and teach our copy and paste gadget how to make this excavator. Uh, and then we will be right back. OK, we are back here in Atom. Uh, and uh, it was pointed out to me that Atom absolutely disrespects any kind of mob spawning, stopping or anything like that. So we're going to have mobs that are going to spawn in this area. There's not really much we're going to be able to do about it. Unfortunately, it's kind of sort of a pain, but hey, it is what it is. Uh, let's go ahead and grab our destruction gadget and just kind of clear out. Uh, let's not do like a large depth, though. Like Let's just do depth of one. And just flatten this area out a little bit. Just so that we have something to work with, you know. Bam. 
and oh, I was like, I voided out my block, but there's my mega torch doesn't doesn't help or anything. And we have a floating Nakata vein, but that's OK. OK, so uh, it was also pointed out to me that chunk boundaries for the excavator don't really matter. What you need to do is find the area where the Nakata is the most saturated, which I did using our mineral tools. If you go into these chunks, it's going to tell you there was a Nakata vein two blocks to the east or whatever. So then you come over and then and you find the center. This is the center area of the Nakata vein. So we're going to set up our excavator right in this general area. It is nighttime uh, and not that it's like challenging or anything, but nighttime in Atom is a pain because there are so many enemies that spawn in. Uh, not that, again, not that they're, you know, hard to fight or anything, but we're going to go home and go to sleep just because I don't feel like dealing with, you know, race and Forsaken and all those guys coming at me. They're just it's just annoying when we're trying to do stuff. Uh, anyway, so copy paste gadget has been taught how to make the excavator. So this is the setup, I'm assuming. Um, let's uh, let's anchor this. I mean, that looks like the amount of materials that we have in our system. Yeah, I have no idea. Is this supposed to go? OK, so I, I think I kind of understand the design philosophy of this. This is like a an excavator wheel, you know, so this is like a giant saw blade. So this cuts into the ground and stuff. And this is the actual, you know, structure for it, um, I guess. I mean, I don't know if it really matters. See, this is Atom. I don't know if it really makes too much difference, but we can go ahead and build this just like here. Let me grab all this stuff out of my inventory. And build it. And see what happens, right? Never used this before, so we'll see. Uh, so we're going to need to smack this somewhere, and I'm going to need to get the book out to figure out where we have to smack this with our engineer's hammer. Or I can just start smacking things. I mean, like, usually it's like that block. Yeah, look, there we go. I didn't even have to do anything. Yeah, look, see, that's the digging wheel. It digs down and then gets the stuff. So I wonder if this needs to be, like, does it need to be in the ground? Or should I have centered it on the mega torch itself? I guess we'll find out, right? We'll figure it out. OK, so uh, we need to find where power comes into this bad boy. Excuse me, guys, please just leave me alone. Oh, here's another one. Get out of here. OK, so let's uh, let's hop on top here. I really need to get proper flight going at some point. Power needs to go into this from somewhere. Is this power? That's redstone. That's item output. Oh, my goodness. Can y'all just leave me alone? Uh, let's see if the book has any uh, discussions about where power goes in and comes out. Uh, not you. It is you. Machinery. Oh, and now that guy poisoned me. Oh, my gosh. Look at all these enemies. Like, I'm about to build myself into a box or something just so that I don't have to deal with these. Look, here's another one. They're coming charging at me. Okay, can I can I do my thing without y'all being rude? Can, can I just, like, come up here or something? My goodness. OK, heavy machinery excavator. So you're going to take power um, requires 1024 to operate. Yep. It fits into the braces of the engine. The energy input for the engine is on its side. The back features a redstone control panel and the item output. OK, so it does say it's on the side. I'm going to assume like these those look like power inputs. Or maybe it's something like over here. Generally, it's like a, uh, you know, orange looking spot in the Kanakata vein. I'm about to just go peaceful mode while I'm in here. This is getting on my nerves. Uh, peaceful. Just leave me alone, please. I'm getting tired of it. OK, so let's go ahead and just set power up and see what happens. We have a, uh, you know, indicator up at the top to see. Yep, there we go. That was power. Easy as that. So it is digging. I didn't know it actually physically dug either. And it's just going to spit items out. OK, 
So let's go ahead and put it all into an ender chest. Now I specifically chose a white, white, white ender chest because that's what's going to end up coming. But look, there we go, Nebu ore. That's what we wanted to see. Uh, so we're gonna get this white, white, white ender chest set up at home and it's going to input into our system. Now, is this going to, is this as far as it digs? Okay, I was like, are we gonna create a massive hole in our world if we do this? Uh, but it does not look to be the case. Now, I did build this along two different chunks. So maybe having it in the same chunk would have been a wise idea, but that's okay. So we need the chunk to the west also loaded. So you and you, both of these will get loaded. It is not inside of any other, is it? No, that's a uh, village. I was like, what is that purple thing? That's a village. Uh, so there we go, yeah. We're getting, we're getting stuff. 10,000 RF per tick, but look, we're getting Nebu ore, which is what I wanted to see happen. That's what we're here for is Nebu ore. And we are outputting uh, power. It doesn't tell you, but we're using the 10,400 RF per tick that it says to operate. So good thing that we have uh, a nitro reactor sitting at home, but this was much easier to set up than I thought was, and I thought it was going to be overall. Okay, so all we got to do is let this run and it'll just keep doing the things and it's going to get us gold, uranium and Nebu. The only it got the strange sand because it needed to clear out the little area and everything. But outside of that, yeah, we're good to go. So let's go ahead and pop home. Uh, we can go ahead and turn peaceful back off. Yeah, that was just anytime I go into eat them now, I'm just going to turn that on. It, that, it just drives me nuts having all of those enemies coming at me. And it's just nonstop. And, it, and it's not like they're difficult or anything. They're not they're not hard enemies to fight. It's just it, they're annoying overall is what it is. Uh, so what we need to do is get an importer. And I'd like to get a stack upgrade. I think I have a set of these and a speed upgrade. Three of them. And what we're going to do is we're going to set this ender chest to import uh, into our system, right? It's just going to import directly into our refined storage system. And we're going to let refined storage handle all of the uh, inputs and outputs and all that stuff and, and where things need to go. So we'll just set this up here and then we'll get our importer and we're going to put it onto here. And then we're going to go ahead and get our stack and our speed upgrade. And basically anything that ends up in this ender chest is going to go into our system, whether it gets goes into our drawers or into our occultism uh, that it's going to be determined by refined storage and let it let it handle all of that. Uh, but we're good to go with this. Now, one thing to note, we are getting kind of close on our occultism uh, with our uh, our storage space limitations. We're probably going to need to upgrade. I we are we're at tier two right now. I think we're going to have to upgrade to tier three dimensional storage stabilizers, which is a new ritual. Uh, and it's going to require some tier two plus some runes of greed and things like that. Though this is going to be fairly easy to make. The hardest part of this is going to be the weak blood shards because we haven't automated the uh, a frit yet. We need to figure out how we're going to handle that because you got to sacrifice a camel and then you got to have something to kill the frit and everything. Uh, so I'm going to be doing a little bit of a Google and YouTube food to try and figure out how we're going to do that. Wow, look at all that sulfur and potassium nitrate. Going to be great when we get into uh, mechanism. Uh, and actually start setting up like our uh, fissile fuel reactor and everything. But yeah, there we go. So we have Nebu ore. Now we need to actually get this Nebu ore processing. Uh, and the best way for us to do that is going to be, since we're actually getting the ore, uh, is going to be probably crushing it like we do with everything else. That gets us uh, one with the potential chance to get two more and a little bit of uranium out of it. I don't know, is there any better... Uh, Starlight Infusion will get us three guaranteed. Pulverizing gets us two. Uh, if we did the mechanism, we could three exit. Or five exit. Yeah, I'm going to assume we can five exit then. I think crushing it's going to be... We can just crush it. We should set up a Crusher Spirit at some point. These guys, as far as I know, can like nine X things. That may be patched, though. That, that may have been fixed. That was when uh, they initially came out. You could like 9x things, but I, I don't think that's the case anymore. OK, so if we crush this, this is going to crush into uh, crush Nebu ore, and then we are going to wash it into Nebu drops. And then can the Nebu drops be automatically compacted into ingots? Yes. OK, because we have that issue here with um, what is in this? 
Easnium ingots, remember those cannot be compacted in this. They have to be compacted in a uh, multi-servo press. So I have to have any Easnium ingots that come into our, ba our basin get pulled out and dumped back into our system to get handled elsewhere. Uh, but let's go ahead and throw Nebu in here. So now we're gonna get Nebu ore automated. Perfect, which means that this guy is gonna continue to run basically forever now. It's just gonna keep going, we're gonna get Godforge blocks and we're gonna do the thing and all of our God shards are just gonna continue on uh, forever and ever and ever and ever and amen. Uh, maybe I should shut this off. Uh, I could set up a detector on the output that we have down here. I don't know how many God shards we need overall though. Like, do we need thousands of God shards to for, you know, production and which God shard do we need thousands of the uh, Osiris ones? Osiris is the ones that I would do the detection on uh, because that's the one that we're going to need the most of. So if we don't have the Osiris ones, we're going to let it run. But this is the one of these is the God Forge uh, da, 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 God Forge output right yeah i could set this so that it only operates with the redstone signal when we have you know 1024 uh yeah let's do this and we're gonna do osiris and we can do 1024 only operate when under 1024 and then you only operate with a redstone signal so when we get a thousand osiris god shards and when we have a thousand osiris we should have a thousand of the others uh i think that's going to be a long time before that does though because there are like 14 or 16 other shards that are randomly generated so we're going to need all that nebu basically is what i'm saying Okay, so that takes care of our excavator. That's great. Uh, let's go ahead and what was the other thing I was going to say that I wanted to work on this episode? Ah, the compact machine. Let's go ahead and get this set up. Um, and getting all this stuff out of my inventory is going to be a pain. So I need compact machine walls. We're going to need uh, at portality. That's probably the easiest way. Portal controller. Item interdimensional fluid module. Uh, it was industrious honeycomb. Eight of them. And, and uh, that's it, right? Yeah, and then it's a mechanical craft. Perfect. Of 25. So we have one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, so this is 25. I'm going to go ahead and get these all put in there, uh, and then we'll come back when we get this thing done so you guys can see what a compact machine looks like. All right, last item should complete this off. Is there a way to automate mechanical crafting? I've never actually looked into that. Uh, it would be nice to be able to not have to do this manually anytime I need a compact machine. Um, but anyway, so what we need to do is make ourselves a personal shrinking device, this guy. And you know what? Our um, morphing tool probably has one. So compact machines, all it is is this little nice block, this uh, you know singular block. And if we right click into this, it'll actually activate it and set it up and bind it to its uh, its it's a dimensional block and everything, but this is it. Uh, it's made inside of its own dimension. This is the com though it's a void dimension, but it's just the compact machines dimension. And it is just cubes like this set up. Uh, I believe it sets them up a thousand blocks apart from each other, each one that you make. And it's just a cube depending on the size of compact machine that you have, you know, so like, you know, it, it, it doesn't say, but like this is like a like a three by three and this is like a, a, a five by five, seven by seven. And it ends up being 13 by 13, I believe, is the largest size. And then we can chunk load this singular chunk. Bam. And then we can set up our network receiver that we have from our system and bind that into here. So then we have refined storage access into here. And then we have infinite possibilities. What I generally tend to do is, uh, like I mentioned last episode, is set up uh, stuff that doesn't need to be in our main base, uh, specifically automations, even our storage wall and stuff. I generally move over to there because uh, storage drawers, all this rendering of the items on them and everything can be laggy as well. So I'll usually move all of this stuff over into a compact machine and then have network receivers and stuff manage all of our, our storage uh, and all of that stuff. That way, everything is tucked away and hidden and it's it's in its own little area. We don't have to worry about it. It would also clear us up to be able to actually finally migrate over to the wizard tower uh, i'd have to move my beacon and everything but we can migrate over to the wizard tower and finally get rid of our house uh 
maybe something I'll work on in between episodes here. But yeah, so we have a compact machine. I'll start working on migrating things into these. I'll probably make some more, uh, but we're going to set up one for mechanism. We're going to set up one for thermal. We're going to set up one for industrial foregoing, and we're going to have all of their machines inside of a compact machine. That way, if we need to add anything additional to it, we can go into the industrial foregoing compact machine. Bam, we have access to all of that stuff. Our thermal one, we have access to all that stuff. It's going to eliminate the need for this giant wall all of stuff. We are going to set up network receivers and network transmitters in there. If you've never used these before, they are fairly simple to do. My question is going to be how much power are they going to use? Uh, currently, we are using 21,000 uh, RF per tick. If we take a network uh, transmitter and we add it to our system. OK, 21,660. And then we pop into our compact machine and I were to set up this receiver center of the room center center and what you do is you take your network card uh, and you bind it to your receiver right just by right clicking on it and you'll see it's linked uh, we can then go ahead and go home or you can use your uh, what happened here I'm probably going to make another of those personal shrinking devices, to be honest with you. You can use your personal shrinking device to take you back out to right where you came into the machine from. Uh, or you can, like I said, just just slash home or whatever. So we're at. 21,660. Where did I put that thing? I attached it here. Oh, really, it wasn't that bad. It's like, what, 500 RF per tick to have a network transmitter set up? Ah, that's actually really not that terrible. I don't like it being there, but that's okay for now. But now if we go to our um, compact machine and I get like a wireless transmitter, because I'm going to want one of these for sure. That way we can access our system while we are in this dimension. Come on, buddy. Finish up. Hurry up. The 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 slow part of this is the pressure chamber, and I don't really know how to speed up. I don't think there's really any way to speed up the pressure chamber. But if we go ahead and pop into this guy again and we set this up here, bam, now we have access to our full refined storage system inside of this compact machine and we can do all the things that we need to do. So I'm going to go ahead and get this set up and then uh, next episode you guys will see what I'm talking about when I say I set this up with, uh, you know, all the stuff and the things and in, in, in the doody doos. But anyway, that's it for today's episode. If you enjoyed, please feel free to like, comment, subscribe. I do appreciate it. It really does help out the channel. Nebu or wise, we're doing, you know, we got 13 ingots. But remember, it's it's constantly making the God shards now, too. So uh, we we have plenty of Nebu coming in. Let's go ahead and check out our quest before we end the episode. We have quite a few. Uh, let's do something like that. And then anything interesting come from our quests? A, a hardened energy cell. We don't want that sitting in our system. A nitro energizing rod. We like that. We got ender cores and cardboard boxes. And actually those storage parts that we got can be automatically converted up to the higher tier. Bam. And then 16K is, yeah, 16K is the minimum that we can use. But yeah, anyway, that's it. Thanks for stopping by. Thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next one. Have a good one.